Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Another day brings another avalanche of secret emails released by WikiLeaks, and we all discover more about what's really going on behind the protective cloak of world diplomacy. Julian Assange, the head of WikiLeaks, is currently imprisoned in the UK. We'll be speaking to his lawyer in just a moment. We'll also look at the explosion of public protest around the world, bolstered, it seems, by people determined to defend WikiLeaks. And in a busy program, we'll discuss today's Nobel Peace Prize ceremony and the forthcoming confidence vote facing Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. But first, Julian Assange. He gave himself up to police in London this week after an international arrest warrant was issued in relation to sex crimes that allegedly took place in Sweden last August. Mr. Assange has been denied bail, but has vowed to fight extradition to Sweden. The lawyer representing him is Mark Stevens, who is with us right now. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Sir David. Um, what, what is your client accused of, and what is he charged with? They're two different things, aren't they? At the moment, he's charged with absolutely nothing. Right. Uh, he has had uh, an int intimation that the Swedes want him to be questioned about a number of uh, reports they've had from two women uh, about uh, alleged sexual misdemeanors. Uh, and that is what the warrant has sprung from. And do you think there's anything in this, this warrant and so on, has been influenced by perhaps the secret authorities of the United States, Britain or somewhere else, getting behind this to try and knock your client and stop him uh, releasing all these leaks? Well, it, it's, it's difficult to, to, to say, but what one can say with certainty is that these allegations were first made in August of this year um, and that the chief prosecutor of Sweden at that time took the view that there was not one shred of evidence to even warrant an investigation, that there was absolutely nothing for him to answer, and indeed uh, she gave him permission to leave uh, Sweden without being interviewed. He asked for permission to go. Um, then, more recently, we've seen a politician uh, become involved, a member of the current government in Sweden, who is also representing the interests of these women. And he took the women to another city, to Gothenburg, from Stockholm, where he'd, they had been with Julian, and began a second investigation on the same facts. Now, in most countries of the world, you just couldn't do that. It would be an abusive process. But apparently in Sweden you can do it. And this uh, prosecutor has pursued uh, Julian in the sense that she has said that these allegations are there, but she has not given him information about the evidence against him. He is entitled under international law, under Swedish law, to know the charges or the investigation that's going on, the allegations made against him, and the nature of the evidence which is said to support it. As I sit here talking to you now, he hasn't had that information. So he's not been able to comprehensively rebut them. And that's what he's waiting for, an, oppor an opportunity to do that. He's been trying to pursue uh, both uh, directly through the High Commission, mm -hmm. uh, through the embassy, the Swedish, uh, the, the Australian embassy in Sweden, through his, uh, my co-counsel in Sweden, uh, trying to get the information from the Swedes. They're, I mean, it's their obligation. The obligation of the prosecutor is to give this information. Ordinarily, uh, viewers will understand that uh, it's the prosecutor that usually pursues uh, somebody for interview. In this particular case, slightly bizarrely, uh, it's Julian Assange who's been wanting to vindicate his name and has been pursuing the prosecutor and saying, tell me what it is that you want to, to talk to me about and I will talk to you. And even now, he is prepared to meet with her and talk to her without the necessity for a warrant. And the prosecutor has been intransigent and decided that she is not prepared to come and meet him, which is deeply unsatisfactory if you're the women who've made these allegations uh, and your matter is not being resolved quickly. And it's deeply unsatisfactory for Julian Assange, whose name has been comprehensively traduced. Do you think they want the extradition authorities in America actually want to get him within their, within their ken, as it were, to go for them on the WikiLeaks front? Yes, I, th I think that the Americans are much more interested in, in, in terms of the WikiLeaks as uh, aspects of this. And uh, we are, have heard from the Swedish authorities that 
there has been a secretly impaneled grand jury in a Alexandria, which uh, some people you'll certainly know is just over the river from Washington, D.C., next to the Pentagon. And uh, they are currently investigating this. And indeed, the Swedes, we understand, have said that if he comes to Sweden, they will uh, defer their interest in him to the Americans. Now, that shows some level of uh, collusion and embar embarrassment. So it does seem to me that what we have here is nothing more than a holding charge, which the Americans won't really matter to them whether he's being held in Sweden or here, as long as he's kind of detained so that ultimately they can get their mitts on him. Because what the, some of the quotes from Americans have been extraordinary, haven't they, about this, about, about the, the WikiLeaks part of the story. Sarah Palin. Uh, said he's an anti-American operative with blood on his hands. Uh, why was he not pursued with the same urgency we pursue al-Qaeda and Taliban leaders? And Mike Huckabee, who was a pres presidential candidate, of course, the headline says U.S. Embassy Cable's culprit should be executed. He goes as far as that. I mean, that is extraordinary, but it makes it makes extradition to the United States seem even less attractive to your client. It certainly does if he's going to die. Uh, yeah. And of course we have to remember that the, 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 the final charge, uh, if it's one of espionage, is the death penalty, um, which we don't approve of. But interestingly, this is a, a peculiarly American perspective that you've just articulated. There is an equally uh, interesting perspective from Russia and China, who come out of these cables particularly badly. And the Russians uh, have accused him of being a CIA operative. That's not been re widely reported anywhere. No. Uh, and the cyber attacks appear to have been coming from Russian and uh, Chinese computers, which again is quite interesting given this uh, concern about him. So he does seem to have picked enemies, if you like, with the three major superpowers, Russia, China, and yeah. the United States. Uh, yes. That's a, that's a wide-ranging choice, isn't it? Yes, there's, there's, yes, another, there's an under un, 181 countries in the world, of course. So that There may could, be an island he could go to yeah, somewhere. He could, he could have that for free. There, there are rumours about, about that there's, there's a secret cache of encrypted and potentially damaging material that WikiLeaks will release if it needs to defend itself. Have you heard anything about that? Yes, I mean, I've not seen it, and I don't have the encryption key, but I am aware the, from reports that uh, 100,000 people have been given encrypted files, um, and that those people, uh, if WikiLeaks is brought down, will be provided with the encryption key so that the material that WikiLeaks has can ultimately come out and be made available to the public. Their belief is that all of these cables should be released to the public in due course. The plan is that they should be uh, released in an orderly fashion that we've had uh, in the, uh, with WikiLeaks working in with their uh, partners, their traditional media partners have, have released them. Uh, but if at the end of the day, through the cyber attacks or whatever, uh, they are prevented from, from actually doing it in an orderly fashion, then it, it will be done in a uh, disorderly, disorderly fashion. Dis disorderly. But ultimately, the truth will out is, is really, the, I think, where they're coming from on that. And what, and what, that really covers the current kind of situation brilliantly. What was it that triggered off your client to do this, to do WikiLeaks? Because he really did kick it off, didn't he? He did. I, I, I don't really know about the foundation of it because I've only recently been instructed by him. But the, the thing that is interesting is that this is the first non-state media. Uh, it's a transnational media. It's not regulated by any national state or, or alternatively, it's by all states. It's a, it's a complex question. And I think one of the questions that we have to deal with is when we get international journalism of this kind, because you know, I think he is an ed the editor-in-chief, and I think he is the person who is uh, working on this uh, as, a, as a journalist. In those circumstances, um, how do we as a society deal with this kind of thing going to the future? And I think those are real challenges for society at large, and, uh, and, and yeah. you know, questions that uh, undoubtedly will pose uh, philosophical that, answers. That's right, because obviously the basic question some people have raised but uh, is, you know, could these leaks, could could what he's done have endangered lives of servicemen or others around the world belonging to various countries? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a very legitimate concern for people to raise, and I think Julian thinks so too, uh, particularly because he wrote to the United States saying, I don't want to release anything that is of, uh, that's going to imperil 
uh, ongoing operations. I also don't want to endanger anybody's life, whether that's a, a security operative, uh, armed, armed personnel, or indeed anybody else. Uh, and if there are any bodies uh, that within the identify within the cables that you don't want uh, published, then let me know. And he, uh, the, similarly, the Defence Advisory Committee, which, as you all know, is a, uh, a group of uh, spies and journalists, work together in this country. They've had the same opportunity, and I think widely regarded that the redactions that have been put in place haven't exposed people to that kind of risk. What WikiLeaks is publishing is exactly the same as the traditional media that we're used to, the New York Times, The Guardian, El Pais, Le Monde, uh, and Der Spiegel. Right. So what, what happens next? Then? What's well, next? Next is the uh, court case, uh, the extradition case. That comes up next Wednesday. Uh, I'll say next Tuesday. And we have to make uh, clear to the court what we think are the issues to be joined uh, as between us and the Swedes uh, about the extradition process. Uh, and through this, Julian remains prepared to consensually meet with the prosecutor, should she care to come to London. Uh, there's not a necessity for this show trial if she doesn't want it, but that, that will take place. Now, as we know from the Gary McKinnon case and many other high-profile extraditions, the NatWest 3, uh, and so on and so forth, this could take some considerable period of time. And there are a number of issues in this particular case which raise European Convention of Human Rights points. And it's maybe that we'll have to wait for the case to go there. So that would be seven years. So it's a long, long way down the road. And of course, we've got to ask for bail for him. Thank you for bringing us absolutely spot on, up to date with the story. Mark, My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Sir David. Now to Oslo, where for the first time in 74 years, the Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded but not collected. This is because the winner, Chinese dissident Liu Xiaobo, is currently serving 11 years in a Chinese jail, and his wife, who was going to collect the award, is under house arrest. What effect will this award have in China, for instance, where the authorities have fiercely opposed it? And on Mr. Xiao Bo himself. Just before the ceremony, I spoke to a man who spent five years as a political prisoner in China and is a longtime friend of Liu Xiao Bo, Dr. Yang Zhenli. Tell me, when was it that you met your friend, the Nobel Peace Prize winner? How long ago did you first get to know one another? Um, I met Liu Xiaobo in 1989 during Tiananmen Square Democracy Movement. Uh, although I um, uh, had known of him for quite a long time, but I didn't get a chance to meet him until uh, uh, when we uh, both participated in the Tiananmen Square Movement. And, and what is 